Good evening all, and welcome. Before this video begins, I would just like to give a huge thank you and shout out to the incredible narrator and my great friend Mr. Ramsey, who has joined us on tonight's video. Please be sure to go over to his channel afterwards, check out his amazing volume of work, subscribe, and show him some love. I'm sure you will really enjoy his content. But anyway, for now it's time to prepare for the walk in the woods. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I've told this story to a few of my friends, and many of them don't believe me. I'm going to be honest, if someone would have told me this, and had I not experienced what I did, I wouldn't believe them either. This happened when I was in Girl Scouts a few years ago. My troop were camping near a Navajo reservation, and in the middle of the night, I needed to pee. And knowing that the toilets were a little far away, and me being quite lazy. I decided to just trot along to behind a bush and do my business there. So, off I went. I did my business and certainly wasn't far from my tent, as it was on the edge. So, I started walking back and that's when I see it. There's something in the moonlight. I can't quite make it out but it does make me stop so that I can admire it. It's a strange shape. Is it a rock? I tilt my head, and that's when I see a gleam, a reflection from its eye. This thing is alive. It tilts this enormous dog-like head, and I stand there petrified. I look up and down, and there's barely enough light to make out some kind of strange, brown, doggish creature. Sort of like if you were to stretch a dog and have it stand on its hind legs. But these legs look strong and muscular and nothing like a dog's back legs. It stood there and it looked at me and I looked at it. For a moment, I thought that this was going to be the end and that that creature was going to take me away and swallow me whole. It looked like it could. It must have been at least seven feet tall, and I'm quite a petite thing after all. But just before I managed to soil myself, the creature, whatever it was, made a mad dash and was gone. It was dark and I couldn't follow where it went, but I went back to my tent and passed out. I woke up in the morning and tried to pretend that what happened didn't happen. I ended up peeing myself in my sleeping bag from the fear, it seems, because I woke up soaking wet. That was unpleasant. Needless to say, I didn't have much fun at camp anymore, and I was always on edge. I never went back. One summer I helped a Boy Scout troop I was part of. I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders. And we took the troop down to Antlodam National Battlefield. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of civil war education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antlodam Creek on the other side of the Burnside Bridges Roads the side that isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnside's bridge, along the creek and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg, so ghost stories about Antitam didn't bother me at all. There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact we were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. It was actually quite beautiful, seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to walk across it, when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. 
I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on a part of the chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, then the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder, and just in from your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had another scoutmaster take a look at my chest and I have two raised red lumps that under the skin you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing and I told him that it just happened when I was walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about any haunting or anything. I called it an evening and turned in. The next morning after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing towards the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid attention more. I found out that the Confederate sharpshooters took up position on the other side of the creek and on the side where we were all at was then Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right on that bridge. Confederates lost somehow in the neighbourhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point my scoutmaster just looks at me and I'm wondering what the hell happened the night before. A couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell phone reception. It's quiet, there is no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, me and our family spent a weekend camping on the land doing our best to clean it up. People had used it as a dump. There were many downed trees, etc. On the second night we camped there, I woke up in the middle of the night to take a leak. As I was walking to the bushes in the dark, I realised that I could faintly hear music. This didn't strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and music. Several other people recalled waking in the night and hearing music, but no two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music and he seemed a bit freaked out. He woke up sometime during the night and went outside to smoke. He heard music as well and had assumed it was someone else. I should mention that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. That wasn't his radio we heard. It wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm a bit freaked out by the place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm almost always armed and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in an SUV with the doors locked. That may seem kind of dumb, but realising that everyone heard different music when there are no people, no functional radios and no electricity is quite creepy. It was a beautiful evening in spring, and I was out camping by myself. I was gathering some wood to stoke the fire. The sun was just starting to hit the horizon and I was gathering my wood so that I could finish my fire and have enough wood for the night. That's when I heard something, a rustling in the trees. Now deer are common in the area, but it sounded different. I look around and don't see anything, and continue my walk until I get some more sticks, and calculate that it's just about enough, and start making my way back. I'm still admiring the sunset as I'm walking back to camp when I hear something again. 
I look over my shoulder and I see something unprecedented. Standing there in the distance is a huge creature. I don't know if it noticed me, but it was walking away. Big shaggy fur covering its whole body. Humanoid and 100% terrifying. I stood there in awe as this beast lumbered away. I wasn't sure if I should get out my iPhone and take a picture, but it was quite a distance away. I ended up trying to snap some, but you can't really make out what it is, other than a brown fuzz in the distance. Not that it matters. No one believes me anyway when I tried showing it to them. I just thought maybe you guys might understand it a little bit better. Things are out there. I've seen it. And I'm scared. I went camping with a summer programme when I was 16, 12 other guys being managed by 4 adult men and we were having a great time, s'mores, hot cocoa, campfire stories, the works. We all had to be in our tents and either sleeping or awake by quiet by 11. I was in a tent with two other guys staying up late just talking, typical teenage guy stuff. As one guy is talking, I start to hear heavy breathing nearby, like someone has just been running and is out of breath. I ignore it and keep listening, and I figure I'm just a weird kid hearing things. Or that it's one of the guys in the next tent making noise while he's sleeping. Then we hear, Please, help me. From outside, it didn't sound like anyone in the group but sounded like an old man out of breath. We all went dead quiet and listened to the guy's breath. Then ask again with a whimper at the end. I don't know what possessed this guy near the front of his tent, but he turned on a flashlight and opened it in a flap, but kept outer zipped and looked out. We see just a pair of bare old scabbed and pale legs standing there. It looked like the guy had been walking nude through the woods for some time. He asked for help, but kept standing there. We were all paralysed with fear, but the guy at the front managed to say, Keep walking down the trail, our ranger should be around soon. The guy stopped breathing and said, No, no rangers, they, they keep me here. It was at this point someone else finally spoke up. A chaperone came out of his tent with a flashlight and cautiously asked him, How long have you been out here? What, what happened to you? The old man didn't answer. He just started sobbing and ran off into the woods. We saw by the flashlight that he was completely naked and emasculated. On a road trip with a friend and we hiked into a trail in Colorado one evening to camp so we wouldn't have to pay for a campsite. Found a little clearing by the stream. My friend set up a tent while I decided to sleep under the stars. Right as we were getting ready to go to sleep, another woman showed up and pitched her tent in the clearing as well. I hadn't been feeling well that day, plus we had to hike in with all our stuff. So when I slept, I slept hard. Woke up to a ranger shaking me and asking if I saw where the bear went. The bear? What bear? Then I look up and see the woman's tent just shredded. Turns out she had left her food in her tent that night. We hung ours from a tree and a curious bear came by at like four in the morning to have a snack. And tearing into her tent, it ended up breaking its claws across her forehead as well. She decided to get out of there though why she didn't bother waking either me or my friend up to let us know about this. I don't know. Anyway, pretty freaky thing to wake up to. Just to clarify some points and answer some questions. Number one, I have no idea how I slept through it. That's what made it even more confusing and freaky when I was woken up by the ranger. I was definitely really tired and like I said, not feeling great. So I know I crashed hard. We were also by a creek so there was definitely some white noise of the water flowing and the woman was on the other side of the clearing so she wasn't right next to us. 
but was she just amazingly calm in a situation? Was she freaking out in total silence? I don't know. She arrived pretty late in the evening and we didn't talk to her, so maybe that's why she just passed on by on her way out. But we were two other females camping out there with her, so I'd like to think if the roles were reversed, I would have woken my camping neighbours up, or like, asked them for help. Number two, I wouldn't call it a bear attack, more like the bear smelled something yummy in that tent and, a and upon cursory examination of the object blocking said bear from the yummy smell, I realised that it quite easily bypassed this object with its claws. So I don't think it was like, roar, kill this tent and all the occupants right now so I can get to this food. More like, hey, something smells good in here, and my claws get through this thing just fine, let me scratch a bit more and make it so I can get in. And in the process of getting in there, the claws also scratch the woman's forehead. Number 3. I know the claws raked her forehead because the ranger told us. She was totally fine. He said he just needed a pretty big bandage and she actually drove to the trailhead with the ranger to show him the right trail. But she didn't want to hike all the way back to the clearing. And number 4. Yes, camping in bear country. If you can't, number one, put your food in a bear box at an established campground. Number two, put your food in a bear canister, often used by backpackers. Or number three, put your food in a car in places where bears haven't learned how to peel back car doors like a can opener. For example, don't put your food in your car. Then you want to hang your food from a tree. You hang it far enough away from the truck on a thin enough branch that the bear won't be able to cling to it and far enough off the ground that the bear can't reach it by standing on their hind legs. If you can't, if you get a bear on a unicycle or still it's coming through your camp, all bets are off. My friend Alfie has a grandmother who owns a lot of land. It was on this land that she used to let us camp some evenings. We wouldn't be that far from her house. So we took our gear and six of us went camping in the woods. It was still quite light out, probably around six. And wanting to play, we decided that we were going to play hide and seek in the woods. I was the first one who had to do the seeking. And we decided that we were gonna make the camp spot the base. And the people who made it back would have the privilege of hiding again next round. So off they went, and I counted to a hundred before I started looking around. They were easy enough to find. There weren't that many spots to hide in in the woods, but we all had a good laugh. When it was my turn to run, I tried to find somewhere quite remote and out the way. I was still running after he'd counted to a hundred, and that's when I tripped on something unexpected in the ground. It appeared that someone had covered this area of ground with a net. One of those army nets, I don't know what they're called. But he'd covered the ground with one, and so I started moving the netting. And underneath was a duffel bag. I was a bit confused what this was doing here, but curiosity overrode me playing the game. And I saw the zip and started pulling at it. It reached the bottom. And with trepidation did I pull apart the bag and see what was inside. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. A collection of knives, rope, duct tape, zip ties, five grand in cash, and keys. Lots of keys. I'm pretty sure I had found a murder kit. When my friend Zack approached me and told me that I was caught, I just told him to look at this bag I found. We were both in awe and horrified. The game ended quickly. We went back to the camp and discussed what to do. There were five of us, and there was five grand, and we were 17 year old boys. So what do you know? We decided to pretend that that money was never there, and pocketed a grand each. Safe to say the secret didn't stay secret for long because our parents found out that we were spending a hell of a lot of money on random stuff and they hadn't given us the money and started to ask questions. But that came after. 
Point being that we decided to show up at his grandmother's house with the bag. She had a look of horror on her face and called the police. They came out, inspected the area and took the bag and asked one important question. Was there anything else in the bag? We all shook our heads and said that the contents were complete. I feel bad now. I think we should have owned up and said that the money was in there. But being greedy little teenagers, we really weren't thinking about that. Only now do I see the errors of my ways ten years later. Nonetheless, we handed the bag over and the police took it away. And nothing ever came of it. Just a few weeks ago, we were on a road trip from BC to San Diego and we came upon a campsite just outside of a crescent city, California. We drove through, one side of the campground was relatively empty. I noticed a few scattered tents but nobody close to the location we needed up picking. We had tons of space. We wanted an early night so I started a fire while my girlfriend started cooking. We ate, had a few beers and climbed up to a rooftop tent with our dog by 9pm or so. I had a rough time sleeping and woke up a few times but finally fell into a deep, decent sleep. In the pitch dark with all our tent windows and canvases closed, I was awoken at 1am by someone whistling outside of our tent, the tune of When the Saints Come Marching In. After a few minutes of this repetitive whistling, I nudged my girlfriend who awoke and was obviously freaked out as well. The whistling then turned to chanting things like, When you sleep here you disrespect me, and when you disrespect me, you disrespect the US Marines. The person would start spelling out words like, flee. The verbiage and tone kept getting more aggressive, so we decided we had to make a move. I slowly unzipped the tent while our guard dog was snoring and got my head out of the tent. And got my head out of the tent. I took a few seconds to let my eyes adjust and figure out where the person was. I felt more confident once I could somewhat see and hear. So I climbed down. The girlfriend passed me the dog and she climbed down too. We flipped the tent up without securing it and we jumped into our truck. Well, the person was still whistling, and we booked it to a motel in Crescent City. The next morning we drove back to get the few belongings that weren't in the truck, and the family had been camping a few sites over, said it went on for another two or three hours, and it was the scariest thing their family had ever experienced. When I was young, from age 5 to 11, my dad lived in an old log cabin about 15 miles west of Sheridan, in the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains. Every summer when I was visiting, we would go up into the mountains backpacking and fishing for two days every weekend. We would park the truck, hike into a remote area of fishing for trout along the way, and make camp wherever we ended up. We encountered a number of strange and creepy things and got into some scary situations with wildlife. But the one that sticks with me the most was an ancient abandoned camp we found. We were hiking down a very steep slope to get to an area of a creek that had been dammed up by beavers. Hoping to catch some big trout. I had climbed out on the rock ledge and was looking for a way down when I saw the stock and action of an old rusty rifle sticking out of a tree, where the tree had grown around the barrel years before. It was about 10 inches above the ground. Dad and I climbed down to check it out and we found a small cave at the base of the rock formation, only about 12 inches deep, which would make a nice natural shelter but a really terrible place to set up a long-term camp. Inside we found a bunch of really old stuff. Three heavy gauge unopened cans of food, an old cast iron pot that had holes rusted all the way through it, a crusty old saddle and burdle set, 
and a very deteriorated heavy wool blanket rolled up and tied with a leather belt. When we unwrapped the blanket, we found several personal items including a rusty old cap and ball black powder revolver, a leather satchel with lead pistol shot, a powder horn with no black powder in it, tarnished old cartridges, presumably for the rifle in the tree, a straight razor and most unsettling was a shirt with holes in it and over half of it stained with dried blood. As we stood there thinking about what all this meant, it occurred to me how remote this place was, even at that time. It was July of 1985, and the fact that whoever owned that shirt had been very seriously injured, stuck on a steep slope in the middle of absolutely nowhere, I got serious chills down my spine. The only thing that somewhat dated this fateful campsite was the pistol and the rifle, both of which were made sometime in the 1870s according to my father. There's no way to ever know what happened to the man who owned all this stuff, but the fact that he or someone he knew was obviously shot twice with either a gun or arrows and all his belongings were sitting right where he left them, possibly 100 years ago. It was highly unlikely he left the area alive. Discovering what amounts to a hundred year old crime scene in the very remote wilderness kind of gave me the creeps. But mostly, it just made me sad to know that how hopeless and alone this guy must have felt when he died. A few years ago, me and my best friend had an idea to launch an eco-friendly fashion brand and design our fashion around nature and the patterns within it. You'd be surprised how many amazing patterns nature has. And I was really into exploring and finding all these cool and quirky patterns I could make from them. It's a bit hard to explain and a lot easier to see. Point being, we were in this really hippie phase in our lives and we thought it would be a good business. She and I both invested all of our savings into it and after a few months, we're still not really making anywhere near the returns we were hoping for. After an argument, and me having a creative drought, I decided to go back to my roots, to try and go back to nature, and hopefully find some more successful patterns, and ultimately, inspiration. So, I took my pencils, my pens, and my little sketchbook with me, to go camping. I didn't go particularly far, I knew the place I was camping quite well. And after being there for a few days, I started exploring more and trying to find nicer and interesting patterns. Stuff like the bark from trees, certain types of leaves, the way that grass can grow and flow. It was all very pretty. And it was on one of these occasions that something had caught my eye. It was a mushroom growing behind a fallen tree. The thing is, this mushroom was beautiful, but it was very near a pitfall, and I saw that if I were to fall down this ditch, I would be in trouble. However, the slope looked sturdy enough, despite the fact that it was covered in foliage that had fallen. So, I put my feet there tentatively, making sure it could hold my weight. Sure enough, it did. And so I sat myself comfortably and got up my pencil and started sketching this epic toadstool. I think I did it justice. And just as I was getting up, I lost my balance. And the worst happened. I fell and I tumbled straight down the cliffside. It was a lot larger fall than I had thought. And I smashed my head on the way down. When I woke up, it was nightfall, or dusk, because there was still a tinge of light in the sky, and my whole body was aching in pain. I looked around me, and there was no one. I tried screaming for help, but my cries were feeble, and my voice was broken. I inspected my body for damage, and although I was full of cuts and bruises and didn't have anything that serious, I felt like my back had snapped. It was in so much pain 
and finding it hard to find the words to even begin to describe the pain my back was in. And so I tried dragging myself, having no idea where I was or where I was going to. I ended up passing out from the pain and woke up again a little bit later into the night, fearful that I was going to die. For those of you wondering why didn't I check my phone, my phone had been launched from my pocket, stupid baggy pockets, and was nowhere to be found. My visibility was severely compromised, and I could hardly get back on my feet without collapsing. When I woke up in the morning after passing out again, I gathered enough strength to pull myself, and I somehow managed to scream. Within about half an hour, someone stumbled upon me. They were kind enough to drive me back and took me to a hospital. I was checked out and within about four days discharged, having lots of drugs put into my system in order to cope with the severe back pain. I had done a fair amount of damage. Even though that was incredibly traumatizing, for me, the worst part was not finding the notebook. I tried going back a few months later, but of course, it was gone. Me and my friend ended up disbanding the business, which was a shame. I think it had potential. A few years ago, I was camping in the Everglades in Florida with a few friends. We all had gone into our separate tents and were starting to fall asleep. The area was pretty noisy with bugs, crickets, birds, etc. I heard this very low vibration, sounding almost like a low roar. It was powerful enough to vibrate in my chest. Suddenly, everything in the forest shut up. No bugs, no birds, nothing. About 30 seconds later, my phone vibrates and it's my friend and other tent texting me, asking if I heard the same thing. The four of us kept texting each other, wondering what it was. About 10 minutes later, all the animals slowly started making noise again. I slept that night with my machete at arm's reach. Ah, a lot of people are saying it might have been a gator. We were in an elevated area that was far from any streams or ponds. Now it's possible there might have been a pond with a gator that we missed, but the very big ones tend to hang out in lakes. We had two tents next to each other, about five feet apart, in the middle of the mountains. I have my three little brothers in one tent and me and my girlfriend in the other. It's night time and we have just put the fire out, so it is dark. Everyone is in their respective tents, snoozing off into dreamland. About an hour later, I'm the only one awake. Suddenly I hear soft, human-like footsteps circling our tents, over and over. Confused, I ask who's there with no response. The footsteps continue, so I step outside. No one. Footsteps stop. I go back into my tent. Footsteps start again. I make my presence known and go back out. But there's no one. Footsteps stop. Of course, I check on my brothers but they are soundly asleep. I repeat the same process about four or five times, believe it or not. The footsteps always stop. I end up just going to sleep to the footsteps and not caring. When morning comes, I ask my brothers how they slept, and they respond with fine, except for you walking loudly around the damn campsite all night. Me and my husband were camping. It was our first time camping in a while, and we were just trying to take it easy, and get out of the monotony of work for a few days. I wake up in the middle of the night because I need to pee. And just as I'm squatting down doing my business, do I hear a woman shriek? Now I know some of you will say it's probably wildlife, but hear me out. This was a woman. I think that someone's in trouble and start to make my way back to camp with my eyes and ears peeled. 
Just as I'm about to get into my tent, do I hear someone whisper, You don't want to go back in there. I look around and hear the scream one more time, but this time it was coming from right behind me. I turn my head around and no one's there and I dive back into my tent, absolutely terrified. I am sweating in cold sweats and I have no idea what has just happened. I tap myself back into the sleeping bag with my eyes wider than they've been all day and try and force myself to sleep. It takes hours, but eventually I do doze off. I never told my husband what happened, but a few years after, when we were having a conversation with a few friends, did they tell us the local urban legends that the forest we stayed at was haunted? I never told anyone my experience until today, and I planned on keeping it that way to try and not sound insane. But seriously, something screamed in my ear, and I don't think I'll ever forget that until the day I die. My pops and I are avid campers, not professionals anymore, but my dad used to be a wilderness guide for kids. We typically prefer the eastern, western Sierras, and they have a great car camping spot next to lakes and a lot of great trails. Last summer we decided to go up for a two night stay and do some hiking. The campground was pretty full, not unusual for the summer, but we were lucky enough, I thought at the time to find a pretty secluded site and we set up our tents. First night was normal, little bear activity, but we are used to that. The second night, I crawl into my backpacking tent, head and toes hit both ends because it's very small, and I pass out cold until about 3am when I wake up to the sound of footsteps. My dad is a diabetic and used to get up to pee around three to four times a night. And the sounds are definitely footprints, but they're coming from the wrong direction. We were located next to the bathroom, so the footsteps shouldn't be moving in that direction. But they're coming closer to my tent. They stop about a yard short and the breathing gets really heavy. I first brush it off as my dad, maybe lost without a flashlight. The breathing goes away. So I fall back asleep, but only to be woken up a few minutes later to breathing right above the tent. You know that rush of terror up your spine? Yeah, I had that. This wasn't dad. I laid perfectly still, but the footprints continued to circle the tent. I had the rain fee on, so I couldn't see through the roof. It was a new moon and pitch black. Now I convince myself, a heavy sleeper, that I'm dreaming. Just as that thought runs through my head, I feel a single finger run the length of my foot through the tent. Real, slow and methodical. Now I figure, I had to be dreaming because my foot is in my sleeping bag and I couldn't possibly feel that. But that comfort disappeared quickly when I realised using the small ambient light available, that my floor was bare and out of the bag. I laid frozen as whatever it was, stroked my foot for a minute or two, gave a few more laboured breaths and then just stood above my tent for what felt like an eternity before disappearing. I stayed up all night. In the morning, I heard my dad get out of his tent. I bolted up and met him by the fire. He looked me in the eye and asked if I had gotten up the night before. I asked him the same and he said that he had around 2am because he thought someone was going through our stuff. As I told him my story, we noticed our gear had been neatly rearranged on the table. Every item. Nothing taken. Footprints in a perfect circle around my tent. We still can't even talk about it. One night I was camping near where an old river dam had been. I pulled the canoe in late so I just draped the tarp over the canoe and crawled in underneath it and fell asleep. In the middle of the night I woke up to the sound of roaring water. 
I crawled up out from under the tarp and the sound stopped. I thought I must have been imagining it or the wind through the trees or something. I crawled back under the tarp and the sound started again. This time, when I crawled out, it didn't stop. The sound got louder and louder. I realised that it sounded like water ripping through the woods. Even the dogs had their hair on end. I quick pulled the tarp off the canoe and dragged it up to the top of the ridge and waited to see what was making that noise. Then I heard the voices. Men yelling and a dull thumping noise. I huddled down next to the boat, pulled the dogs close and waited for the sun to come up to find out what was happening. Morning came and there was nothing to see. To this day I don't know what it was but I have my ideas. I will not camp there ever again. I was told that the land remembers and that's fine. I just don't need to be there when it's remembering. I've been a park ranger for a few years now. And every once in a while, me and some of my buddies get together and have a few drinks at a local bar. On one of these occasions, one of the friends asks us what was the creepiest thing that had happened to us while working as a park ranger. Now, I personally don't have any stories other than run-ins with wildlife and such. But that's when one of my other friends, Brad, shares this. He was fairly new to the job and on a routine inspection discovered a tent. He had a look around. The food was fairly fresh, plenty of personal belongings to indicate that it was still in use, and he decided to carry on. The only reason he decided to check it out in the first place was because some people had reported it been there for a while. Clearly, it was still in use though. And that was it. He went off and did what he had to do. About three weeks later though, he was in the same area, and went back to check on the tent, assuming that by this point, it was probably gone. However, when he went back, everything was exactly as it was left the last time. He remembered how eerie it was, stepping inside and seeing the food that before was fresh, now decomposing in plastic. He found this quite grim. Everything had been left untouched, so he decided to leave it. He wasn't sure if this person just didn't care for cleanliness, or if perhaps they weren't coming back at all. He came back one week after, and sure enough, things hadn't changed. So the procedures were put in place to remove the tent and its contents, and that would have been the end of it. But a year after, something strange was discovered. They found the partial remains of a skeleton buried deep in the undergrowth. Brad to this day is unsure because he never did pick up any information about the investigation. If perhaps the missing camper or the person who owned that tent was the one found. To this day, he still questions it. And now, so do we. This happened in 81 or maybe it was 82, I'm, I'm not too sure anymore. I had made friends with a fellow I worked with and offered to take him gigging for frogs. He was from the city and had never spent any time in the woods at night. The farm I had permission to go to was only about a mile from my place. My friend showed up at 10.30 or so and I gave him a gig and a flashlight. We decided to walk to the other farm. We didn't get far before we both heard something walking in the dark to the side of us. Now, I've been in the woods all my life, and I've had plenty of deer follow me, but I wasn't going to tell him that. It was clear he was getting spooked, um, so we climbed a fence and continued on. Then we heard something else climb the fence. Deer don't climb fences. I tried looking around with the flashlight, but he wanted none of it. We could see the house lights of the place we were going to, and he ran off on me, 
and he beat on the guy's door until he let him in. By the time I got there, Mr. Barber, the, the landowner, and his wife was out on the porch and wanted to know what was going on. Mr. Barber and I went back and had a look around but found nothing. My friend refused to walk back and Mr. Barber gave us a ride back to my place. We never did find out what or who it was that was following us. My friend decided that frogging wasn't for him. He also refused to go on several fishing trips I had invited him to. I can't say I was too comfortable with what happened, but I hadn't let it stop me from frogging. While backpacking the Alpakian Trail in northern PA, a friend and I just finished hiking up a very large hill and were ready for lunch. We had planned on eating at a shelter that was another two miles down and up another hill. After some discussion, we decided to eat at the shelter as there would be more water. Well, as we arrive at the shelter, we come across who we initially think is another hiker. But no, this guy was just carrying an old school backpack and was digging for crumbs out of the bottom of the frittles bag. So he seemed out of place. We asked if he was backpacking or day hiking. Never making eye contact, he mutters out, backpacking. We then asked if he was section hiking or through hiking, as in doing the entire trail. He looks at us with this weird look and says, um, I'm just hiking through. After a little bit of talking and avoiding all of our questions, he just quickly said, I, I gotta go. As he packed his bag, we asked what his trail name was so we could look out for him on logbooks. He clearly had no idea what we were talking about. And this struck us as odd because anyone that hikes knows what a trail name is and usually has one they go by. After sort of explaining what he meant, he said, Alright, um, it's Hatchet. Which was obviously a load of crap because the guy was holding a pack axe in his hand when he said this. Well, we continued hiking and we reached our camping spot. We got settled for the night when I was awoken by Hatchet rustling through my backpack. Now, my friends and I both use hammocks and I had my backpack wrapped around the tree my hammock was hanging on, so he ended up shaking my entire hammock. I screamed, hey, and he looked at my hammock, stared right at me for a good second, then bottled. By the time I got out of my hammock, he was nowhere to be seen. Turned out he had stole a pack of tuna from my bag and a couple of granola bars from my buddies. Never saw him again. The weird part was, we got back into town and ate lunch at a diner. Turns out old Hatchet was on the run. There was a wanted poster hanging up on the door. Turns out two weeks prior he had mugged a couple of people leaving one guy pretty bloody. The whole thing was pretty freaky. We gave our statements to the police but never heard if they caught him or not. I was going camping a few weeks ago with some friends. We had all decided to just get a few beers and have a nice chill out session with a campfire. That's what we were doing. But at some point, my friend Emily wanted to know what was around the area and insisted that we all put our beers down and have a nice little walk around. So that's what we did. Emily was the first to shoot up and started going off in a random direction. We all followed and within about 15 minutes, we came upon an old dilapidated house. It looked like a house that had been standing there for about a hundred years, entirely made out of wood. And you know what? We were somewhere so remote, I think we may as well have been the first people to discover this in a long time. Or so I thought. We have a look around the outside, and we try the front door. It swings open with no resistance. And as I'm looking around, Emily is heading upstairs, and she lets out a small gasp. We all run up to quickly check what's going on, and that's when we see it. The skeletal remains of a person in the corner. Judging by his jeans and his top, maybe a man. 
we all look at each other and no power of there. When we get back to camp, we report it to the police. And after some follow-up a few weeks later, we get informed that it was a homeless man that had disappeared about 15 years ago. He'd probably wandered in there, run out of money or food or something, and died up in that dilapidated wooden shack. Shame, really. Quite a sad way to go, all alone in the middle of nowhere. I work in the outdoor field and lead trips regularly. I once led a trip to the top of Mount Stringer in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top and about six miles from the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor. We were camping out on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other co-instructor went to bed in their tents. I chose to spend a night in a hammock that night. I was really into a book and was reading, so I stayed up and read until about 10.30pm. I turned my headlamp off to settle in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the moon, and from the position I was in, I could see down the trail we had hiked to get to the top. I laid there enjoying the scenery and noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in the area, so I perked up. As it got closer, I could tell it was a person. We were in the middle of nowhere and there was something or someone hiking up the trail with no headlamp or any gear. I was just frozen watching this person move closer to our camp. The person arrived at the top of the mountain where we were and just stopped. I watched as what appeared to be a man surveyed our camp. I really could only see the outline of him and he stood there for what seemed like 30 minutes, but may have been 10. He then turned and sat down under a tree facing our camp. He was sitting up in a way that I knew he was trying to sleep. He just sat there staring at our camp. I had no idea what to do. I decided to wait it out. So I waited, just staring at the man while he stared at my camp. This went on till about 3.30am. Then he stood up, took a moment to survey my camp a few minutes longer, and then went back down the trail he came up on. I, to this day, have no idea what that was all about, but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip. I need to give you a bit of background information so that you can understand this fully. I was 22 at the time. Me and my boyfriend had been together for seven years. He was my first ever boyfriend. We had started going out when we were still in school and had stayed together that whole time. I never went to college and neither did he. We both just got regular jobs so that we could be together and closer. We even had a young daughter together. She was three. Part of me thought that that was the only reason he stayed, because of Nancy. Anyway, my mum agreed to look after Nancy for the weekend, so that me and him could go camping. Camping wasn't my break of choice, but there you go. He really wanted to be in tune with nature, and said that we would have a great time. Now. Something else I need to mention is that me and my boyfriend had been on the rocks for a while. We weren't living together, and we thought that this could help strengthen our relationship, which we desperately wanted to do as we had a daughter together. So, I agreed, and off we went. He took us to a nice remote camping spot in the middle of nowhere. I can only imagine why he wanted to pick somewhere so remote, and I don't think there's any prizes for guessing here. The first night was nice. We were having a really nice time. He bought champagne, grapes, and really made me feel special. Saturday morning we woke up, and somehow we got into an argument, and he refused to talk to me for a few hours. So I ignored him and read my book on a tree. Last he decided to stomp around and look on his phone. 
when his phone finally depleted of battery, he started trying to argue again, at which point I'd had enough of his juvenile bullshit. This tiny argue escalated, and we said a lot of mean things. Basically, it was the end of our relationship, and it was in the worst possible way. He also confessed something to me, which I had only suspected before, but now, since this was the end of all arguments, he decided to just spew it over me. He had cheated on me, not once, but twice, with two of my best friends. What a kick in the ovaries. And so with that, I decided I had had enough of his bullshit. I told him that that was it. It was over, and that I never wanted to see him again, and that he could never see his daughter again. Okay, okay, of course he did get to see her, but I was pissed. I grabbed my shit, put it in a small bag, and ran off into the woods. Now, this is where I made my first mistake, because I had literally no idea where I was or where I was going. He drove us here in his car, and this was his tent. I was genuinely clueless. I'd never even camped before. I just ran and ran and ran and was crying my eyes out, stopping occasionally to wipe my tears and just carried on running, thinking that perhaps he was gonna chase after me and desperate to ensure that did not happen. When I'd walked for about an hour, I then realized I was well and lost, but in my humble mind, thought that I knew the way back if I needed to go. Somehow I told myself that in a few hours I would make my way back. I'd walk back, We'd sort of make up, maybe, and everything would be fine. Or worst comes to worst, insist that he drive me back. And that's what I tried to do. Only, when I got back to the location which was where we were camping, he was gone. How did I know it was where we were? Well, it was because we had a little fire pit, and the embers were still there. I remember making a little spot for us to go to the toilet, and sure enough, that was there as well. He just packed up and left without me. And of course, he killed his phone by draining the battery, so there was no way of letting me know that he was ditching me in the middle of nowhere. Now I was starting to freak out, and the light was depleting from the sky. I panicked. I started walking towards where the car was, but the car was gone. He'd driven in through some rural backcountry roads, and I told myself that my best chance was to follow these roads. The darkness approached very quickly, and without any light in the sky, I was alone in the dark. I couldn't see my way, and after falling down a few times, I walked into the foliage, lied down on some leaves, and cried myself to sleep. I was absolutely terrified. The whole night, small noises kept waking me up. Think of the fear of being stranded, having no idea where you were. I was shitting myself. I just can't explain how terrified I was. In the morning though, I got up and I felt a little bit better. And I walked my ass off down all these roads but every road seemed to lead somewhere I didn't know. This was backcountry. These could have been old logging roads for all I know, and it seemed to be an endless maze of going nowhere. Darkness was approaching once more, and I was incredibly hungry and absolutely exhausted. I was crying to myself, because by this point, my phone was dead as well. And of course, yesterday, when I tried telling myself I could leave by myself if I just followed the path, I was way too stubborn to give him a call. Or give anyone a call for that matter. And now the option was gone as well. The next day, I woke up again, still stranded, genuinely thinking that I was going to die out here in the wilderness. When fortunately, I saw a passing van. I ran into the middle of the road and flagged it down. And there was a nice family in there. And I asked them if they could take me to civilization. They told me that they were driving in to do some camping for the week. And I asked them how far away I was from civilization 
and explained that my boyfriend had left me here two nights ago and that I was lost, alone and really needed to get home. They took pity on me once I explained everything. I hopped in and had a nice conversation with their two sons. The drive back to my house took nearly an hour and I gave them a hundred dollars and was so, so grateful for their help. They were happy with a little tip and were just glad I made it home and went on to do their camping trip. Needless to say, I have never forgiven him. He does get to see his daughter on alternate weekends, but Christ, I can't believe he would do that. For all he knew, I could have died out there. Would he have gone back for me, I wonder? He says he would, but I will never know. Not something I experienced, but my sister and her husband did. My family used to have a cabin on a lake in the Northwoods. It's a lake with no public access. On the other side is, or was, an old girl's camp that the state was letting fall apart. The camp had a large two-story main house that was mostly intact at the time. My sister and her husband decided to check out the camp one day. They canoed over and started to walk around. They went into the main house first. They walked around for a bit and then they heard heavy footsteps coming from upstairs. These footsteps turned into someone running heavily towards the stairs. My sister and her husband booked it out of the house, but they could hear the steps coming down the stairs and on the main level as they ran out. They opted to run around the house instead of heading back to the shore. They never saw who it was, but they heard them enter back into the house, and then they heard them storm back outside again. They went into the woods this time and heard someone running in the woods after them. They took the long way round to the lake back to the cabin. My dad and I had to go back later that day to get the canoe. We never heard or saw anything. I was camping at the base of Tejeras Peak in Colorado near the lake that sits at its feet. I am about to fall asleep when I hear something walking outside of our tent. The sound of small twigs snapping underfoot. It is slow and careful sounding. I start to think and hope that it's just a deer or something wild. I'd much rather it be an animal than a human because a human slowly walking around our tent in the middle of the night is probably up to no good. My ice axe is just outside the tent, so I think I'd try to slowly unzip the tent and grab the axe. Then the thing, it, it starts making noises. It stops moving, maybe five feet from our tent and it starts breathing heavy and then scraping on something just outside of the tent. Suddenly it stops. Again, and maybe 20 seconds later, it makes another odd sound. Kind of like a person with hoarse vocal cords trying to say, ha, huh, but more forceful. The whoop doesn't sound like an owl, it honestly sounds human. I quickly unzip the tent and grab our ice axes, and I'm ready to start swinging. I'm too chicken to jump out of the tent, so I just lay there clutching my axe. The thing finally walks away, and I'm so tired from hiking all day that I fall asleep shortly after. The next morning we get up and survey the area, finding that the stump a few feet from our tent had been gnawed or scratched on pretty significantly. There weren't any large hoof or footprints around the camp. So to this day, I wish I had have jumped out and shined my light around to see what it was. Allow me to give a bit of backstory. My wife and I had two beautiful baby girls. Before we had kids, we had both been very outdoorsy. Active campers 
and explored all over the country. However, you know what it's like when kids are small. It's very hard to organize and almost impossible to carry out. But we felt our girls were old enough and decided to get a big four-person tent and share this experience that we loved so dearly with them. They weren't too thrilled with camping, to be honest. But if I recall back to my own youth, neither was I. After a few days, though, they got used to it and started to see the fun in all of this. It was on one of our last nights that this experience occurred. The girls had already gone to sleep in their tents, and me and my wife were just outside by the fire, having general chit-chat time. We look at our watches and decide that it is indeed time for bed, as the girls, still being quite young, have a tendency to wake up early. And I don't feel like it's a good idea to let them be unsupervised at such a young age, outside in the middle of nowhere. So, back into the tent we go. For some reason that night, I had trouble sleeping. It was one of those nights that when you go to bed when you're not sleepy, and the sleep doesn't quite grip you. I was tossing and turning, and I just couldn't do anything. So, I pulled my Kindle out and started to read, on the lowest brightness setting. I was trying very hard to focus on my book, but something was wrong. Something was nagging at me, and I couldn't make out what it was. After a few unsuccessful pages, which I had to keep rereading, did I hear something. In the bushes, nearby, I could make out a sound. A rustling. It sounded like someone was coming this way, or something. I lowered my Kindle, and then shut it off completely so that no light would illuminate our tent. The embers of the fire might have still been going, but I was hoping that it would be enough so that they wouldn't see us, who or whatever they were. Just to give you a bit more info, we were in quite a remote part of this area, and there shouldn't have been anyone else around, at least not in my books. Why would anyone go stalking around in the middle of the night? I was thinking all of these things when a flashlight was pointed straight at the tent. The girls didn't see a thing. They were all passed out. And I saw the flashlight and nearly crapped myself. Who was this? I then heard the rustling. The person, it was definitely a person, was now walking quickly and with purpose towards the tent. I started to freak out. So, I quickly made my way out of my sleeping bag and towards the entrance of the tent, just waiting. It was then that I heard the person walk around the tent. The flashlight was no longer on. They were contemplating what to do. It felt like hours. I was frozen there in terror, worried that something was going to happen, that the person was going to bust in. I had forgotten my gun in the trunk of my car. A tactical decision, my wife said to leave it, and that we would be fine. And I felt like a moron. I sat there, eerily quiet, hearing the leaves crunch underneath this guy's boots. When all of a sudden, I hear the tent zipper slowly start to descend. It was fight or flight, and when the tent was open enough, I lunged out and threw him to the ground. I managed to do it a lot better than I thought in my mind, and that's when he pulled a knife on me. We stood there in the darkness, me in a sort of attack stance and he with a knife, neither of us moving. He didn't give any reason or explanation, and I didn't give any words either. In a dead stare off, he looked at me one final time and just turned around and walked away. I don't know what all of that was about, but it left me absolutely terrified for the entire night. I found more logs, stoked the fire, and sat there rocking back and forth, making sure that he wouldn't come back, with a stick as my only defense. In the morning, I tried to be cool, but after breakfast I had to spill it to my wife 
and I wasn't keeping it together. We ended up packing up camp pretty quickly, made our way back to the car, and she drove home as I passed out. Around 18 months ago, when my girlfriend and I first got together, we went camping regularly with a couple of friends in a large ancient forest. We would go in, set the tent up in the light, have a barbecue and some beers, then sleep well, our friends would. We went several weeks running, same routine, different friends each time, until one night we decided to leave the tent and return later so we would get some more supplies. We returned to the tent at dusk, but found a stick figure made from twigs at the entrance of the tent. We smoked a bit, had some booze. One of our friends, who reluctantly joined us on this occasion, turned strange. He disappeared into the woods, which we found strange as he was petrified on the way into the woods. And then when we could hear nothing but singing for at least an hour, he eventually returned and he continued to party until it started to rain heavily at which point we decided to call it a night. We woke up in the morning and decided to pack the tent down. It eventually became obvious that the trees surrounding our tent had the same shape as the figure carved in the bark. We pretty much rushed to get out of there and came across a still burning pit of fire surrounded by felled trees. This was the final straw, so we ran the remaining mile back to my car. I have to add that the woods I'm talking about has a history of deaths and suicide, and has also had reports of witchcraft too. In fact, the surrounding 20 miles has quite a lot of stuff just like that. Just after finishing our GCSEs, a group of friends and I went camping. The weather was naff and on the whole huge campground there was pretty much just us and a group of Irish scouts. So we all ended up hanging out together along the youngish guys who ran all the activities on the site. Technically any activities had to be booked and paid for in advance but these guys were bored so they let us do anything that didn't involve expensive equipment for free. On our last night they took us on the pathetically unscary ghost walk. It was so woozy that we took over in the end and started telling them creepy stories. When we were all pretty much ready for bed, our group went across the field in our tent, all laughing and joking until one of the other girls stopped still and said loudly, What's that in the front of our tent? There was a short, white figure pacing in front of one of the tents, about 30 feet away from us. It was dark, but we could all see it as a solid looking shape. One of the girls screamed and it stopped pacing and rushed at us. I've never run faster in my life. I lost my shoes halfway across the field and kept going straight onto the tarmac road and down to the activities building. We went back with about 20 scouts and some burly guys with big lanterns, but there was nothing to be seen. Who knows, it was probably just mist or something, but it was scary at the time, it hasn't put me off camping though, I just needed to man up. I was in my tent and it was the middle of the night, perhaps 1am, and I'd woken up to go pee, just like normal. I was about to unzip the tent when I heard a small scratching sound, so I paused. It was a slow, deliberate, crunchy digging sound. It was too rhythmic for an animal, so after making sure it wasn't my dad who was sharing the tent, I unzipped a corner of the door and peeked out. The moon was just bright enough for me to see a young woman squatting right next to her little two-man tent, digging at the ground with her bare hands. My dad went and shined a flashlight on her and told her to go back to wherever she had made camp. The woman got up silently, leaving a four inch deep hole next to the tent, and started walking away. I went outside, went and peed, and got back into my sleeping bag. A few minutes later, I was awoken again by a clattering sound of a person or an animal walking around where we had put our stuff. 
I looked outside again and the woman was crouched low, walking around our stuff and looking at things the way a monkey might. My father stepped out of the tent, shined the flashlight on her again, and she faced him. He asked her to kindly leave their stuff alone, but she just stood there, dirty and neglected looking, but clearly not malnourished, staring at his light. He gave up and went back into our tent. Soon we heard her digging again at her little hole, which was literally six inches and two pieces of thin nylon away from my head. I shouted for her to go away, and she ran away in an animalistic kind of way, and never returned. I fell back asleep, and in the morning, our stuff was scattered, but luckily nothing was stolen. I hate camping. I've always hated camping. I've been three times and each and every one of them has been worse than the last. The last occasion though made me quit for good and there's nothing my girlfriend can do that will ever make me change my mind. We were camping with her parents, something that I tried to get out of desperately. I even bought concert tickets to a gig in another city to try and convince her that this was infinitely more important. But, in her world, family comes first. So fine. I mean, it does in mine too, but when it comes to camping, everything else comes first. She, however, didn't see it that way. She'd been camping since she was a little girl, which makes her enthusiasm far more understandable. I mean, who doesn't like dirt, bugs and leaves all over you at all times? The risk of being stabbed in the dark by people you don't know and having to share a toilet with Mother Nature, it is beyond me. But I went along with it, like a good boyfriend, and we did the camping thing. On our very first night, did something extremely creepy happen. We were supposed to camp for three days, needless to say, we only camped for the night. So the fire had gone out, and we were all in our tent. I didn't get the privilege of sharing a tent with my girlfriend because her parents are quite strict. And so I'm there just playing my DS and trying to fall asleep. When all of a sudden, I hear someone walking around. I don't know who it is, but my girlfriend is a prankster and I assumed that it could be her. Maybe she was playing a practical joke on me. Maybe she was going to sneak in and give me a goodnight hug before bed. I don't know, but I'm feeling relatively safe at this point and try not to think too much into it. I mean, there are four of us here after all. So like I say, I try and ignore it. When all of a sudden, there's a gunshot and the bullet goes right through my tent. If I had had my head just slightly higher than where it was, I think I would have been killed. I look in absolute horror and hear people running around still. I don't move, and after a few minutes of silence, I dart out and inspect the damage. With the campfire still going strong, it's very clear to see where the bullet entered and left, and the people that made the sound, and probably shot the gun, were long gone. Her parents come out as well, and we all inspect. Safe to say we packed up and left. I don't think I'm ever going to go camping again. I don't know who those people were. None of us caught a glimpse of them. And if we called the police, what would they do? I just hope they were idiots playing around that got lucky and didn't hurt anyone. Instead of people out to get me. Or us. This happened to an acquaintance of mine and his son. This took place back in the early 90s. He had taken his young son for a father and son type hike out of Skagway. If any of you are familiar with Skagpatch, it is quite a network of trails above town at Lower Dewey Lakes. So, it's evening, dinner done, tent up, bedtime. Sometime later, around midnight, he's woken up by the tent shaking violently then silence. Then again. 
keep in mind it's late August and pitch black. I mean as pitch black as you can get under the heavy coastal rainforest with no moon. The shaking kept up for over an hour. He had no idea what it was. He went out with his headlamp, yelled and heard nothing. would go back in the tent, then it would start up again. He could hear footsteps whenever it happened. He was pretty shaken up by the next morning, as you could probably imagine. He reported it to troopers, and the only thing they could come up with was someone with a night vision set up, messing around, or something else. Me and my friend were camping one night, and we were just outside of a circle of cabins. It was a bright night, with all the stars shining and the moon was well lit. There was a campfire going, and in one of the big cabins there was a party going on with music and so on. We were walking, and we both got a really weird feeling, as if we were being watched. We both turned toward the sea. We saw a a blue figure, it was very tall, at least seven feet walking through the trees. It made no sound at all. It was a bright blue and glowing figure walking through the forest. It was emitting a shimmery aura and my friend and I both became very frightened. We shouted at whatever that thing was and we were asking it what it was. We got no reply, of course, but we expected one. We stared as it walked away and out of our vision. We didn't dare follow it. We then ran back to the group of people at the campfire, screaming and describing what we had just saw. Another friend of mine claimed he was watching it from a distance, not far from where we were, and was just as frightened as we were. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. First and foremost, I would like to give a huge thank you to my good friend Mr. Ramsey for joining me in this video. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on my friend. And to everyone listening, please go over and check out his collection of amazing work. The description's on screen soon and in the description we'll send you to his channel. Please be sure to subscribe, send him some love because he really does deserve it. I hope you will at least give him a chance to impress you as he has already impressed me. But anyway, for now guys, it's time for me to sign off, because it's time for you to follow the link and check out Mr. R. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.